resuming recording and opening the room. We're definitely live. Welcome friends. We'll get started in just a moment as we keep getting folks in the Zoom room. And I'm going to put in the chat box the links to today's event. And that will contain library information as well as information about today's event. And I'll be trying to keep up with notes as it goes on. If book recommendations come up, I'll try to keep those in. And we'll give it right at the hours when we'll start. Get some more folks in here. I'm glad to see we had such a nice robust attendance for today's event on a beautiful Saturday in San Francisco. <clears throat> all right, it's 11 o'clock, let's get started. Thank you all for being here again. We welcome you here and it is Summer Stride 2021, our second virtual Summer Stride. Um, I'd love to hear you know, from you how you think virtual library programming is going. My email will be in that document that I shared. Um, or any feedback or any programs you'd like to see. This is actually a program that somebody emailed and requested. Succulents and drought gardening, it's coming. And as I mentioned, we are here today for Succulent Gardening with Kip McMichael. Thank you, Kip. We wanna welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramitush Ohlone tribal groups as the rightful stewards of the lands on which we reside in the Bay Area. The library is committed to uplifting the names of these lands and community members. And we encourage you to learn more about first person culture and land rights. You can check out our YouTube for the many programs we've hosted. And there's also a reading list um, in that document. I'll refer to the document a lot. It has a lot of info, a lot of great info. Um, so it's also pride, June, I love June, um, pride month. So we have a couple events coming up. We kicked it off on Tuesday with Brontez Purnell, who is our on the same page author for June. On the same page is when we try to get all of San Francisco to read the same book. So everybody read 100 Boyfriends. We also have, and you can catch that Brontez and um, Alvin Orloff interview on our YouTube channel. It was super fun. I laughed and I blushed. So good times. Um, coming up some pride programs. And these are all next week. Lots of great stuff. Not next week, but coming up. I can't wait for Tom Amiano. Kiss my gay ass. What a great title. And then we'll have a book club featuring Brontez will not be there. I must repeat, Brontez will not be at the book club, but we will discuss 100 Boyfriends. It's a fun book. All right. And next week's we have next week, Summer Stride, we're going to feature an organization called ABO Comics who um, works with LGBTQ plus prisoners. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. And they do art as their vehicle. So uh, they raise funds, they support the artists and support incarcerated or incarcerated community. So this is a big um, uh, issue of San Francisco. We have a jail and reentry services department in our library. We are so proud of the work that they do in helping um, reentry folks in our incarcerated pop, uh, community um, get books, get materials, get information. So really proud of their work. Tuesday, we have Jenny Worley um, talking about her book, Neon Girls, and she was very instrumental in unionizing the lusty lady, San Francisco history. And the Asian Art Museum will join us again. Saturday, a Saturday program. So I hope all will come out for this one. I know Saturdays can get beautiful and warm and everybody wants to be outside. But if you know photographer Danny Lyon, he is amazing photographer and he's shot some of the most iconic photos you probably don't even realize. But um, he will be speaking, we'll do a film, uh, film screening of, S S of SNCC. Oops. If everyone could stay muted, helpful. Thank you. Um, so come, come out for this one. And um, he'll be in conversation with Lewis Watts, who is also a famous photographer here in the Bay Area and was behind the book, Harlem of the West. 
So hope you can all make this one, definitely pushing. And then just some highlights from summer. We have the amazing uh, Kisi Lemon and Tango Ice and Martin, our poet laureate, in conversation with Marlon Peterson, whose book, Bird Uncaged, an abolitionist freedom song has just been released. So check out the books. Long Division by Kisi Lemon has also just been republished. And he also wrote the book Heavy, which is amazing, amazing. I cannot say enough about um, Kisi Lemon's writing. And some gardening programs coming up late June, we have children's gardening with the California Native Plant Society. And then in September, as I promised, we'll have a drought program, a gardening for drought resistant. Uh, I can't exactly remember the title, but it's coming. All right. <clears throat> so today we are here about learning about gardening with succulents with Kip McMichael. Kip is a professional web developer and amateur naturalist with several degrees, none of them plant related. But don't tell that to his overly large plant collection. He grows native plants, succulents, and far too many bulbs in his home garden in Berkeley, also Ohlone land. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Kip. Welcome Kip, thank you for being here. All right, thank you. Um, welcome everybody. So let me share my screen. All right, so uh, today's talk is about succulents in small spaces. Um, obviously for almost every one of us gardening in San Francisco and the Bay Area more broadly, we are probably gardening in a small space. Um, I have a little bit more room than some over in Berkeley, but um, not very much, about 5,000 square feet on the whole lot. A good bit of that is house. The rest of that is a backyard that I don't get to dominate with succulents, but I do have a front yard that's full of succulents. All right. Um, so three parts to the talk, um, just an intro, um, some talking about designing the succulents, and then <clears throat> a more focused talk about succulents in small spaces and what you can do to, to um, uh, fill in the space that you have. All right, so um, to start off with, kind of an intro to succulents. So um, succulents live everywhere. Um, there are all kinds of succulents and they can grow in all kinds of places, um, especially in the Bay Area. Um, being in the Bay Area, um, we are um, you know, blessed with a climate that is very conducive to all kinds of succulents. Since succulents tend to be plants that are very um, hydrated, they're plump with water. That's one of the reasons that they are succulent. That's what gets them through the harder times in their natural habitats. Um, that it makes them prone to being sensitive to cold. So if you have hard freezes like we do further inland, um, that can definitely be an issue for succulents. So we're especially blessed in the Bay Area to be able to grow almost any succulent that we can, um, that we can see. <clears throat> so, you know, there are succulents that handle shade well. Um, this is a, the, the dark plant here is an Ionium. <clears throat> it's called Schwarzkopf. Um, the plant lower down here is probably an Echeveria species. Um, these are Sempervivums, also called Hen and Chicks. This happens to be a photo of a, of a roof. <clears throat> um, you know, in their, in their natural range, I believe in Europe and like the Mediterranean, they often grow in stonework, um, roofs and walls and things like that. Um, get, yeah, there we go. Um, and, you know, cyclones can be large. So this is an aloe banesii. This is a tree aloe. Um, this is probably a fairly old aloe banesii, but certainly um, an aloe like this, you could get a, an aloe tree like this in the span of like 20 years. Um, they, they, grow, they can grow fairly fast. <clears throat> succulents can also be ground covers. Um, this is a little zoom in of a, a succulent pot um, that I had some years ago. Um, nice color and form here. Um, this is a, a shot of, of my garden, um, just a little a bit of rock work here. Um, this is a somewhat shadier spot um, underneath the tree. Um, it gets a good bit of sun early in the morning, but it is shadier um, most of the day. So there's some nice plants here. Um, string of pearls, uh, Senecio raulianus is a nice one here. This is a bromeliad. Maya Recrobata. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> so well draining and mineral based soils are going to be good for all the succulents that you might want to grow. Um, being that we live in San Francisco um, and in the Bay Area more generally, we have a, a kind of a large mix of soils. If you're in Western San Francisco, you probably have a good bit of sand in your soil. Um, if you live in any of the, the mountains or the slopes, you probably have a good bit of rock um, in your soil and otherwise you know, clay. Um, 
So generally speaking, you know, if you have hard clay soils, you want to do a little bit of mixing in of some coarser material. Pumice is a great amendment. Lava rock is a good amendment. Coarse sand can be helpful. Um, if you do have thick clay, just even a, a mixing in compost can also help open that up a little bit. Um, it's good to add other um, uh, um, coarser materials like the sand or the, the lava or the pumice um, if you're going to be adding uh, fine compost as well because that will, that will soak up more water. Um, what you don't want to add is wood. So um, you'll even, um, you know, this is somewhat surprising sometimes because the soils that you find succulents in when you buy them from a lot of places will often have a good bit of organic material in them. Um, and that is more for the purpose of the industrial growing that needs to take place. Um, mineral based soils with lots of rock and pumice in them are heavy. Um, and so you want lighter soils if you're producing commercial plants. They ship more cheaply and they're easier to move around, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're making your own soil for, um, you know, for pots and for um, beds and stuff, um, it's good to leave out things like coarse wood. So no, no need to have wood mulch, for instance. All right, um, succulents are not necessarily full sun growers. Um, so not every succulent grows in the sun. Um, these are some photos from just natural habitat. Um, so these are, um, you can see here, you know, this is a desert um, um, uh, area and this is a, probably some kind of uh, mesquite. And underneath that we have mammalaria growing. Um, this is a shot from Arizona where you can see saguaros um, have started all underneath the shade of, uh, looks like a Palo Verde. Um, this is a shot from Arizona, but this slope is actually a northward facing slope. So this, um, this side of the rock doesn't get sun until later in the day. Uh, this is just to show that even if plants, um, you know, even if you have succulents and cacti of various kinds, they're not always something that grows in full sun. So uh, the San Francisco garden that isn't fully exposed, um, as many of them aren't, um, you can definitely still grow lots of succulents. Now, bright color will definitely, uh, or rather bright um, sun will definitely help with the color of the succulents and also keeping them on the dry side. So for instance, this is an aloe, a, a great aloe for gardening, aloe nobilis. Um, this is one that's grown um, with more water and in a shadier spot. And this is one that's grown with less water and in a sunnier spot. Um, and sometimes this could be the same plant just over the course of a season, for instance. Um, winter, when it's shadier and wetter, the plants may go green. And then in summer, um, with the, with the uh, drier conditions and the brighter sunlight, they may they tinge red again. Um, this is just a, a shot of some succulents growing under a tree. Um, you know, these don't look too bad, but um, the colors have definitely faded out from being in the shade of the tree. <clears throat> um, likewise, these are some indoor succulents. Um, these succulents are what um, they look like after they've been grown indoors for a long time um, and when the, the light isn't bright enough. Um, and so these plants have kind of lost the tight shape um, the tight rosettes and the short fat leaves. They're, they're trying to expand out and sort of pull in more light because they're in shadier conditions than they would prefer. Um, and then this is a shot of more, you know, um, well-grown succulents in a really bright spot. Um, so this is a nice um, hanging panel garden. But here you can see, you know, the bright purples, the reds, um, the yellows, the, the greens, all the leaves are nice and tight and fat. <clears throat> um, so succulents are also not zero water plants. Um, that's one of the, probably one of the most important things to emphasize if you do start gardening with succulents. Um, succulents do expect water. Um, they definitely can handle periods without water. Um, that's why they are succulent. But in the habitats where they grow and where they're successful, um, they definitely experience enough water to keep them you know, satisfied and happy. Um, and so in your own garden, you know, watering every two weeks or so during the summer is usually a, a good idea. Um, and sometimes you don't need to water at all during the winter. Um, over here in Berkeley, um, I need to water a little bit more in later winter when it's drier um, and in early fall when it's drier, but I don't water at all in the winter. Um, and during the summer, I water it most every two weeks. Um, and if we have any sort of rain in between um, my waters, I usually just skip a week after whatever rain we get. <clears throat> So succulents can definitely, you know, this is an ionium. Um, we saw um, the Schwarzkopf earlier in the, in the images. So this is an ionium that is not getting enough water. Ionium in particular are, are plants that, even though they're from a Mediterranean climate, it is very dry. They do expect a, a decent, a reasonable amount of water. They can handle no water. They will shrivel up. They will um, contract their rosettes um, and try to wait it out. But if you give them good water, they'll be much happier. 
Um, this is even a cactus. Um, so this is um, uh, called the Old Man of the Andes, one of the common names of this cactus. Um, this is one from my own yard. Um, even I can fail with uh, plants. This particular spot was drier than I expected, maybe more sun, maybe the, the, um, the spot that it was planted and the water drained away quickly or didn't build up there as much. But anyway, I only discovered this after a while, but um, you know, this cactus has clearly um, not had enough water. You can see it's pale yellow. Uh, it's very shriveled up from what it should have been. Um, so yeah, this is just an example that even cacti can, um, get, can be too little watered. Um, and this is an Echeveria species, or maybe a hybrid, maybe a Graptivaria of some kind. Um, and this is just another example from my own garden. Um, plants all around it seem to be fully happy. Um, we have some Euphorbia here and some, some other Echeveria, some, some other plants. Um, and all of those are just fine, but this plant did not get quite enough water. So even with succulents, you do have to sometimes um, coddle certain plants, give plants more water than you might expect. All right, um, it's always best for succulents if they have drying periods between watering. Um, one of the reasons they are succulent is because they have evolved to handle um, periods of dryness. So naturally they want to be a little bit dry in between waters. So if you're the kind of person who needs to water certain parts of your garden every day, um, it's best if the succulents aren't in those parts of your garden. Um, and just like with uh, bright light, um, um, lower water um, encourages both good form and good color. So um, succulents do want um, plenty of water. If you overwater succulents, however, they will become um, too exuberant, too gregarious. Um, they'll start to um, you know, lose some of their tight form. They'll extend out their branches in, in ways that may not be as strong or as uh, sturdy. So it's good to, to be conservative with your watering, steady and conservative watering um, with good light and you'll have nice looking succulents. Um, this is not so much an issue here um, in San Francisco with uh, cold temperatures, but we do, we do get dips here and there. Um, and certain spots can certainly be colder than others, depending on where you are. Um, and so succulents can certainly handle temperatures below freezing. Um, this is an aloe from South Africa. Um, and you can see definitely you know, this is a cold, cold environment here. Um, this is a Sonoran Desert image from Arizona. Um, and this is just a shot from a, a grower's yard in the Midwest. Um, but in all of these cases, there are certainly succulents that can handle very cold temperatures. Um, and to the extent that San Francisco is often cool um, and sometimes wet, um, gravitating towards succulents that can handle cold conditions is usually a good strategy um, for, for finding good succulents. Um, a drier plant, and this is the case for almost any kind of plant really, a drier plant is more cold hardy than a wetter plant. Um, the danger of, with plants and, and cold is that the water in their tissues will freeze and damage the plant. And so a plant that has less water in its tissues is less likely to freeze. All right, so, so thinking about succulents in your garden. Um, so there's you know, a few, few things that I like to think about that are a little bit different about succulents or you know, kind of in, in, you know, uh, distinctive about them. So succulents are slower. Um, there's a little asterisk there because um, as um, some of you may know who, who grow succulents. Some succulents can be pretty fast. They can take over a, a bed or a planting pretty quickly. But for the most part, succulents compared to a lot of other plants are much slower. Um, and so that means they just don't fill space as quickly. Um, and, you know, that's not necessarily um, a bad thing, um, but it does mean that you want to think about that when you're planting um, and also, you know, be, um, be sensitive to the fact that because succulents are slower, they don't recover from injury of various kinds as quickly. So, Here's a few examples from my own garden. So this is a, um, a, a blue cactus. Um, when I first planted this cactus, unfortunately, it was um, uh, in a different orientation to the sun than it had been from the place that I bought it from. And so that's one of the things about cacti is that they can sunburn. Um, all plants, in fact, can sunburn. Um, some of you may have experienced this um, with your own plants if you've moved someplace. Um, if you've rearranged plants on the patio, um, on the deck or something like that, you may suddenly find that, that leaves that were fine or you know, have brown spots on them and start withering and dying. Um, that's an example of plant sunburn. Um, plants are very sensitive to their orientation to the sun. If you were to go out to the desert in Arizona and dig up one of the saguaros and rotate it you know, uh, 15, 20 degrees um, and plant it back in the ground, it would get sunburned from the change in orientation um, to the sun. Um, so that just means that you need to be careful when you're moving succulents or adding succulents to your garden. If it is in a really sunny spot, the kind of spot that gets sun for most of the day, um, you want to do that um, at, ideally in the winter when the sun is less intense. Um, and then sometimes you might even want to add a cover um, over the plant um, while it acclimates to the brighter 
winter sun. So this is an example here on this cactus. The top area has grown since I planted it and since it got sunburned, this yellow band is the band of sunburn. Um, and so that unfortunately will always be yellow, discolored, sunburned. Plants, un unlike humans, can't recover from their sunburn either. So a sunburned part of a plant like a succulent like this will always have that appearance. Um, this is an example, um, a few years ago, we had a, an extra cold spell um, in Berkeley and this uh, one of the edges of this plant started having some rot, so I had to cut that off. <clears throat> uh, this is a, an agave that um, fortunately someone walked into the yard and, and pulled a leaf off of. I'm, I'm not sure if maybe they thought it was an aloe and they could use that. Fortunately, agaves can have some irritating sap, so um, hopefully they didn't try to use it on their skin. Um, this is a particularly bad sunburn in my own yard. Um, this, this cactus was originally another blue species of cactus. Um, it would have been grown in shadier conditions and um, it did not take well at all. So it got severely sunburned. All of this yellow is a severe sunburn um, and the discoloration is where the sunburn was so intense that it actually blistered and, um, and kind of similar to humans. You can definitely give a, a plant a very bad sunburn. Um, since this time, this plant has grown new growth out. Um, it may be in one of the later pictures that we see and they're now nice new blue um, growths coming out of the cactus. So it can grow in full sun, no problem, but the change from where it was growing before to where it's growing now was enough that the, the um, parts of the plant that already existed got sunburned. All right, um, succulents are really productive minimalists. Um, and so that means that they, um, you know, they have fewer prunable parts. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, you know, a succulent doesn't have a lot of leaves necessarily. Um, or a lot of things that can easily be cut off. The branches are usually kind of minimal. This is an agave perii, a very nice agave. Um, it would work well in San Francisco as well in a sunny location. <clears throat> but as you can see, there's not really much here you can do to trim this plant very easily. Each of these leaves are bigger than your hand, very tough and covered in spikes. So that's just something to keep in mind with um, your succulents is that if you do put them in certain spots, you need to allow for the fact that it's not going to be easy to trim them um, and sometimes if you, you know, sometimes you can't trim them because there's only one, you know, central stem with only one portion that can grow at all. Um, this is an aloe, a young aloe tree that's in my front yard. Um, and, you know, this is just showing how, the, you know, there's not really a lot that's prunable here. You can cut off some of these pieces, but there's only one branch here. Um, so there's not, not a lot you can do. Um, this is a large euphorbia um, as well. It has a few large branches. Now, the nice thing about the, um, the, the minimalism of these plants. So many succulents are very easy to propagate from cuttings. So um, you know, if you cut off a branch very frequently, you can just leave it to the side and then plant it a few days later and it will grow. Um, some succulents are actually prolific um, on their own tissue. So this is a Kalankawa. Um, there's a whole bunch of different um, forms of this plant um, and all of them have this wonderful feature of growing tiny baby plants at the margins of their leaves. So this is a, this is a plant that act, can actually become sort of a pest because as you can imagine, these babies can you know, break off and get started in the cracks between the sidewalk or underneath the hanging pot this might be growing in or you know, down, down, the, down the bed. Um, but in, in many ways, you know, having a plant that is a, a bit of a, um, a hassle can be great if you have like a street planting or something like that that gets a lot of traffic. Um, succulents are also easy to propagate um, from a lot of their leaves. So sedums, especially, this is a, these are some sedum leaves. Um, you can frequently break off a leaf um, of these plants, um, let it harden up just a bit, and then um, leave it in a you know, somewhat shaded spot, and it will start growing a tiny baby plant at the, at the bottom of the leaf. Um, not all succulents can do this. Um, many of them that have leaves that look like this can't. So it's, uh, sedums certainly can, and a few others can, but not all of them. Um, and succulents um, mature, you know, steadily into well-defined shapes, and they usually hold those shapes over time. So you can see here, this is a nice agave Victoria regani, um, and so there's a large one here and a much smaller one, but you can see, you know, kind of the same shape, just increased in size slowly. Um, another agave, this is the um, agave perii that we saw earlier. Um, it's a really nice one. Um, and then this is just shot from the Huntington Garden down in LA. Um, but this just shows some large cacti and how those mature. So these are golden barrel cactus. This is another one that you know you can grow in San Francisco as well. Um, and it's a little bit happier in warmer climate, so it won't be it won't be a, um, a champ in San Francisco, but you certainly can grow it. Um, and down in um, Huntington and down in its native range in Mexico, it can get very large and over time can slowly clump. Um, some plants are more um, apt to clump than others. In fact, when you're at the, the nursery, if you're, you're getting plants, 
um, cacti, various kinds, you can frequently see plants where one pot will have lots of small um, plants that seem to be clustering and one pot will have just a single large stem. And that's the same thing here. You can see these are a very clumpy plant that's you know, put off lots of babies uh, here in the foreground as well. Whereas this large plant doesn't seem to have any offsets yet. Um, <clears throat> but you know, these plants are also very old and these are probably 70 or 80 year old barrel cacti. They, they don't grow very fast. So these are some very mature plants. Um, microclimates are really important, and in San Francisco, um, you, you probably, if you garden much, know about microclimates. Um, winter shade um, can be really, you know, a kind of a, um, a very wet um, circumstance that also stays very cold. That can be a problem for some succulents. Um, a lot of succulents um, do really well here in the summer. They suffer a little bit more in the winter. Um, so a, a, a darker or a colder spot can be harder for them. Um, one thing to keep in mind in San Francisco, and this is in the Bay Area and everywhere and, and you know, everywhere in the world, anywhere where you garden, um, are radiation frosts. Um, this is one of the things that I find that the, the people, even experienced gardeners, are the, the most um, ignorant of um, in terms of this being a phenomenon that you have to handle. So um, even on nights where the forecasted low is nowhere near freezing, so a night when it's 37 degrees, 38 degrees, when a night when the And so we have a nice clear sky in the winter um, and there's not a lot of air movement, um, you can have a radiation frost. And so what happens in that circumstance is the heat in the ground and in structures, trees and things, it radiates off into the air and in the infrared. And so even when the air temperature around things doesn't get very cold, the surface of the ground, the surface of objects like your roof can go down below freezing. Um, and this is something even, I, I used to live in San Francisco, I lived in, lived in San Francisco for about seven years. Um, and I had a rooftop garden for a while um, on top of my apartment in Portrero Hill. So in one of the warmer parts of the city. And I had frosts on my rooftop on at least two or three nights a winter. Um, so you can definitely get frost in San Francisco, but they're radiation frosts. So the nights when I had frost on the roof, the forecast low in San Francisco was probably 37 degrees that night or, or even as high as 40 degrees. But because of radiation frosts, you can definitely have frosts even on those kinds of nights. Um, and in, in addition to those radiation frosts, when you do have cold air being produced, like the roof of your house or um, you know, other structures, you know, rocks around you, pavement even, um, that can flow down um, downhill. So if you're at the bottom of a hill, if your house backs up to a hill, and so your backyard is kind of a trough at the bottom of a hill, that can be an especially cold location. And so likewise, on those radiation frost nights, you can get an especially um, hard cold in your own backyard. Same thing happens in my backyard because the cold air rolls off of the roofs around you and builds up in the low spots. All right. <clears throat> so um, slopes and air movement, you know, as that graphic showed, are great. So a lot of us um, in the Bay Area live in hilly locations, and so um, that's that can be good for um, letting the cold air drain away. Um, unfortunately, like I mentioned before, if you're at the bottom of the hill, that can also mean the cold air comes to you. Um, but that just means that um, succulents that have the ability to, you know, for the air around them to keep moving um, are great. In my own yard, for instance, my front yard is right on Ashby Avenue in Berkeley. Um, and so that open street area allows the air to move through. So I rarely get any kind of um, frost in my front yard, whereas my backyard that's um, surrounded by other buildings and has roofs um, emptying onto it gets frost probably four or five, you know, um, 10 or 20 nights a year, depending on the, on the winter. Um, and if you do want to get ambitious with certain succulents, there are certain succulents that want a dry winter rest. Um, they like their water in the summer. They even like the Bay Area climate of cool summers, but what they want is a dry winter. Um, those can be kind of hard, and so those can, um, those can be a challenge in the winter, so that can require frost cloth or other kinds of shading to keep some of the rain off of them. All right. So now we can move on to thinking about designing with succulents and how you can put together a succulent garden. So as we mentioned before, succulents are kind of slower. So, you know, it takes more time for succulents to fill up space. If you plant a bed of succulents, there's going to be, you know, it's going to take longer for them to fill up and mature into that spot. But one thing to be careful about is if you want to use more plants. Um, and so you can have some smashed plants. So this is an early shot of um, one part of my garden when I had first planted it, and this was planted 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> so to focus here, we have a little euphorbia, clumpy euphorbia here. This is a small echeveria, and then this is an agave. 
So um, about four and a half to five years later, um, these were how the plants had grown in. So everything's grown in nicely, but as you can see, um, everything's a bit smashed together now. Um, and if we zoom in, the little echeveria here actually used to grow about here. And slowly as these plants have gotten bigger, it has, it has extended itself out and managed to just keep up with um, the, the growth around it to manage to, to not be squished and covered up completely. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind that when you do plant succulents together, you need to account for the fact that they will grow slowly and sometimes they can end up crowding each other out. Here's another example. This is a, a large aloe that I have, and this was a cactus that was planted next to it. And the aloe was originally smaller, um, but aloes tend to grow faster than cacti. So it eventually got bigger and managed to smash the top of the cactus beside it with one of its leaves. So a little bit of plant competition, sometimes it's unavoidable, but something that, um, you know, in retrospect, I probably would have planted these further apart had I known how quickly the aloe would have grown. All right. Um, and so knowing your plants is important. Um, so montane and interior species are good, even though you live on the coast in a fairly mild climate. Um, we are cold and wet here in the winter which is um, not necessarily what a lot of succulents expect. So it's good to go after plants that are from more interior areas. They can handle colder conditions. They can handle wetter conditions. So this is an agave from agave utahensis. Um, it happens to grow in Utah, but in other states as well. Um, Opuntias, um, this is another native. Um, it can handle very cold conditions. Um, it's a, it's um, you know, it can handle all kinds of conditions. You, you see this growing along the coast as well. Sometimes it's been introduced. Um, this happens to be an Escobaria, but there are lots of small little cactus like this. Um, they grow in the Midwest and in northern Mexico, and they can definitely handle you know, wet, some, somewhat wetter conditions. It depends. Some cacti from um, the Midwest are very sensitive to winter moisture, and some aren't. This happens to be one that's resistant to winter moisture. Um, it would, I would be remiss um, in talking about succulents in California if I didn't talk about Dudleyas. So here's one of them. Um, Dudleys are a wonderful native succulent. Um, they've recently been in the news because of some poaching problems, um, but um, they definitely are wonderful plants. Um, you can find them very easily um, at nurseries. Um, I, I even found the, the spring Home Depot had a huge um, flat of Dudleys growing. It looked very nice. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a Euphorbia, Euphorbia clavarioides. Um, it's a wonderful plant. Um, you can see this growing, um, a really nice couple of these growing up at the Botanical Garden at UC Berkeley. So these are all plants that are from colder regions. The euphorbia here is actually a zone five plant. So you could grow this in Utah if you wanted to. Um, um, and then this is a, a really nice uh, South American plant. It's called Orbia variegata. This is a relative of milkweeds. Um, all of the um, plants in this group have these wonderful starfish-like flowers with you know, great texture. Some of them are fuzzy. Uh, they stink to high heaven. This plant will attract flies. Um, it's good to know your plants as well because you don't know, if you don't know your plants, you don't know how big they're going to get. So here's an example of a whole bunch of agaves. And so these agaves all look very similar, um, but they will um, end up on vastly different trajectories. So this agave and this agave can end up being four, five, six feet across. This agave might never get bigger than a foot across. This agave might ne ne never get bigger than five inches across. Um, so all of them can, you know, could easily be mistaken for one another if you weren't paying attention, and they can get definitely to very different sizes. So um, most likely in San Francisco, you don't want a single plant that's going to grow to be, you know, seven or ten feet across um, from when you plant it. Sometimes you do, um, but frequently those can be surprises. Um, and agaves like this um, end up being a mound of, you know, sharp pointed swords um, that can be difficult to deal with. So it's always good to know your plants. Um, another example are some lookalikes. This is Fenestraria called Baby Toes. Um, it's one of my favorite plants. Um, and this is Frithia. It is not Fenestraria. And whereas Fenestraria is fairly successful in the Bay Area, um, in a, in a, a little, protected from the wettest winters, it will do just fine and you know, survive for years. I have plants in my own garden that have been around for seven, eight, ten years. Um, this plant wants dry winters and it will rot away if it's cold and wet. So it's good to know your plants and make sure that you get your accurate identification because even plants that look almost identical can have very different care requirements. This is another agave. This is a shot from my own garden. Um, when I bought this agave, I was not as um, savvy about my agave cultivars. 
I had hoped that it would stay small. Um, and this is an agave that can get to be about seven feet wide. Um, so eventually I had to chop this out with an ax, unfortunately. I did feel guilty about it, um, but it um, had grown far, far, far too big for the spot that I had been, that it had been given to. Um, all right. Um, so it's good to keep your faster growing succulents segregated. So earlier when I said that succulents were slow, there was an asterisk there. And that's because succulents aren't always slow and certain succulents are certainly faster than others. So here we have a wonderful succulent, Oscularia deltoides. Um, it's a great plant. Um, it's pretty widely available. You can find it in a lot of nurseries. I've seen it in Home Depot as well. Uh, it is a wonderful ground cover, a wonderful um, rock wall kind of tumbling plant. It's really um, vigorous. Um, it has this wonderful pale bluish color with pink stems. And in the springtime, um, like right, right about now, for instance, in my own yard, um, it is covered in bright pink flowers completely covered in bright pink flowers. Um, this oscularia, however, has been planted with a couple of aloes here and then some uh, sedum here. And the oscularia is growing much faster than the rest of the plant. So you can see it's already starting to tumble over and cover up the aloes. The aloes don't grow as fast. Um, so it's good to keep plants like that separated. Again, this is, you know, this is all learning in my own garden. In hindsight, I would have separated these plants if I'd known how they would have grown together. Um, this is a shot from earlier that we saw. I'm um, just coming back to this. So this wonderful little plant here is called String of Pearls. I absolutely adore it. Um, it's a great plant to grow. Um, it looks wonderful tumbling over rocks or over the edge of a pot. Um, but it can, you know, it can be pretty vigorous, especially in the summer um, when the water is good and the temperatures are warm. It can get pretty, you know, it can grow pretty quickly. And you can see here it's starting to smother this little cactus. I'll probably, you know, um, go in and trim this away to make sure that it doesn't grow too closely um, and, and um, make the cactus unhappy. Um, here's another example of some other plants. So this is a, a shot close to that earlier one that um, had the oscularia and the sedum here. This is another aloe that's also being overtaken by the sedum. So again, just another example of where, you know, if I'd known, I would have moved the plants around um, and had a different set of plants um, growing closer to the aloes or had the aloes growing closer to slow plants. <clears throat> Um, and so, you know, succulents can be hard to move, um, as I you know, showed earlier that, um, you know, that agave was just a, a mound of teeth. Um, I did lose a bit of blood in taking it out. So it's good to you know, make sure that you um, know what you're planting and where you're planting it so that you don't have any prickly situations. Um, and so also, um, it's great to get the right materials. So some succulents can have some problematic sides. Um, so euphorbia, um, a really wonderful succulent. There are tons of euphorbia, all kinds of shapes and sizes. A lot of the plants you've seen in the pictures have been euphorbia. They produce a white sap. Um, it's a, a latex-like sap. Um, not everyone is sensitive to it, but some people do get contact dermatitis, like when you get poison oak um, from having the sap on it. So it's good to you know, be careful of that. I don't happen to be particularly sensitive to it myself, but I've definitely seen people who have you know, poison oak-like symptoms from getting it on. Um, this is just another euphorbia, wonderful um, euphorbia here, euphorbia flanaganii, but just more of that sap. Um, here are some zoom-ins of some agave thorns. Um, you can see here, actually, this agave was close enough to the sidewalk on my, in my front yard that I made sure to regularly prune the thorns off um, so that as the leaves expanded out and got close enough that someone could potentially have touched them, um, it wasn't going to um, prick anyone. But you can see here, so this is a, a new, brand new leaf. It's just starting to come off the center. Um, and this is one that I've already pruned the, the tip off of. Um, and perhaps the thing that I would warn people about the most are glockids. So glockids here are these little tiny fuzzy tufts. So a lot of cactus have these, um, especially a lot of the cacti that are pretty popular at um, um, nurseries and you see uh, frequently on you know, the flat of cactus that you might find at a Home Depot or something like that. You'll frequently see um, Opuntia, Opuntia are a group of cacti that have a lot of glockids. And they're like tiny hairs, but they're much stiffer. And so I, you should think of them more as like micro needles as opposed to hairs. So this little cactus isn't fuzzy, it's covered in micro needles. Um, and those needles can get in all parts of your skin. They're particularly bad on the soft parts on the, like the back of your hand. Um, if you happen to eat cactus fruit, you can get them in your lips and at the edges of your mouth. Um, 
very, very unpleasant. So I, I myself stay away from the, um, the glockid producing cacti, like the little Kuntias and stuff. They look very cute. They're the cacti that you know, kind of look like a, a little Muppet or a sock puppet with little kind of tufts all over it. Um, they're wonderful plants, but um, I, I keep away from them just because if you are in the garden working around them, needing to weed and, and, um, and you know, uh, prune things, um, you know, just barely brushing across this cactus won't even hurt at all. And then only later do you realize that there's all these little tiny irritating needles in your hand. Um, I have some great tools that I use. Um, you can go online and find some really large tweezers. I have a set that's about a foot and a half long. Um, you can get some great forceps. Um, all of these are great for working with your cacti. Once you get stuff planted, you can certainly have an issue with, you know, weeds and things. And so those tools are great for being able to, to get near something that's full of thorns to kind of prune out a dandelion or something like that. Um, as far as pest controls go, um, succulents are actually pretty easy to care for most of the time, um, but there are a few things that you will inevitably get when you have succulents. And so one of those are aphids. So here's some aphids on the bloom stem of an echeveria. Um, they, um, aphids need to have fairly soft tissue to drill into, and so usually they go after things that are faster growing on succulents and bloom stems are frequently faster growing. So this is just a, a bloom stem that's been covered with aphids. Um, a really easy way of handling this is a jet of water. So you can get a, a, a special end for your hose, and then some you know, multi-hoses have a mist setting, and so you can use that and sort of support the bloom stem with your hand and then just kind of scrub it down with the mist setting of the hose, and that will dislodge the, um, the aphids. Physical removal is usually completely effective. If you do it for a few days or a few weeks in a row, um, it'll usually eliminate the problem. Um, now, another thing you have to contend with are the ants. Ants are farmers, um, and ants will bring bugs to your plants. So this is an example of a little cactus growing in a pot on my back porch. Um, this cactus is, you know, nowhere close to other plants. It, um, it couldn't have picked up these um, aphids that are growing on, or these mealybugs, rather, that are growing on it. But in fact, ants brought the mealybugs to this plant. Um, if you watch closely in your own garden, you might sometimes see an ant carrying one of these around and they will find places to farm these bugs. Um, and so that's something that you, know, you have to be aware of. This is the same, same treatment as the, uh, the aphids that I mentioned earlier, just a good mist from uh, um, the hose. We'll usually dislodge all of these and physical removal is usually all that you need to do. <clears throat> all right. So um, yeah, there's definitely techniques for succulents, um, not in just small spaces, but everywhere. And, and, and these garden techniques are usually good for all kinds of growing as well. So I'll go over those. So topographical features are great. So flat spaces can be very pretty. This is a, a, a succulent pot from my garden as well. You know, they, they, can, they can look very nice, but they can get to be a bit monotonous um, and there's, you know, things can get to be crowded there. So if you are gardening in a small space, um, topography is definitely something that can really add. So this is a, a similar pot to the one from my garden that's been mounded up in the middle. Um, it just allows you to get more plants in the same space. Um, here's a shot of a garden on a slope. Um, and as you can see, this is a, a wonderful 1970s photograph. Um, and um, as you can see, the, you know, there's a ton of plants here. And if you, were to, if you were to flatten the slope down, all of these plants would be on top of each other, would be you know, overlapping, would be shading each other out. But on a slope here, even all of these plants crowded as they are, each get plenty of light and you, know, you can see them well, and they can grow well. So topography and slopes definitely maximize what you can fit in your garden. Um, here's a small spot. Um, this is at the edge of my driveway. So this is a this is a bed of about a foot wide that's between the side of my house and my driveway. And so I mounded up a few rocks on the back of that bed and planted dirt in between the spaces in the rocks. And so this is another example where if we were to flatten this bed down, all of these plants would be on top of each other. But with just a little bit of topography sort of stacking them up, you can get many more plants in the same spot um, and they're all pretty happy. Um, so here's a shot of my yard. Um, so when I originally got the yard and at the end of the talk, there's, I've got some more um, yard photos to show sort of the, the transformation of my yard from a non-succulent yard to a succulent yard. Um, this is a shot, um, you know, several years into the garden. Um, and so I had brought in a whole bunch of dirt to make several mounds in my yard. Um, and so this is a large mound that kind of wraps around this side of the sidewalk. There's a mound right here as well. Um, and so that's allowed me to put a lot more plants and, and grow them well, give them all the sun that they want. All right. 
right. Um, so plants, you know, you want to space your plants out. Um, you don't want to have them all, you know, you don't want to garden with succulents as if that's the only thing that needs to be there. Um, and that's really a, a good rule for all kinds of plants. You know, other kinds of features, gravel, rocks, wood, you know, large pieces of wood can all be really nice in the garden. Um, rocks give you topography. Um, they um, also give contrast. They, you know, they, they, they can give a, give a nice clean background to the succulent so that you can admire their shape and their form and their color. Um, they also just take up space. So you, know, you don't have to feel like every part of the yard needs to have a plant there. You can instead take up some space with other things. Um, being in the Bay Area, being in San Francisco, there's lots of rocky slopes that rocks fall out of all the time. So it's um, a lot of these rocks you see in the pictures, these are from my yard. Um, I found these rocks um, you know, on the side of the road, um, up in the hills um, in the East Bay. Um, you can do the same thing um, on the peninsula and in San Francisco, all over the place. This is another early shot from my yard. I've kind of changed things up a lot since then, but you can see heavily use the rocks um, and the rocks also form the spots where other things can grow. So um, rocks aren't just taking up space themselves. They're also kind of giving some landmarks to your garden um, that you can use to you know, give you tips about where you want to plant things. This is just another example. Uh, this is a, a, a shot that's actually looking down one of the paths that's in my garden that I can use to access the garden to weed and stuff. And so these are just a couple of set, stepping stones here. <clears throat> but more topography with lots of rocks. Um, and then this is an old manzanita burrow um, that I got as driftwood. And so this um, is also just another kind of um, part of the, the garden that I, um, that's not plants, but adds enough you know, character and beauty to the garden as well. All right, um, gravel is great for your garden. Um, it um, both um, keeps the soil you know, kind of moist, um, it keeps the soil from getting hot. Uh, a lot of succulents have shallow roots because they wanna try to catch the, the water as soon as it hits the ground. And so a really hot um, soil surface prevents them from being able to grow their roots as close to the surface, whereas a nice gravel cover will be much better for their roots. Um, <clears throat> and gravel also will help discourage weeds. Um, it heats up in the sun well, so that can kind of discourage plants from getting started. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me drink some water for a second. So um, one smart thing to do with succulents, because succulents are slower, um, they don't compete as well with weeds. So other kinds of plants, you know, you can plant them. If weeds get started, usually the plants you've planted will kind of grow faster than the weeds. And so, you know, it's not so much of an issue. Succulents are going to be very slow. And so if you do start with a bed that's already got lots of seeds or weeds um, in it, then you're going to have a, it's going to be a problem. So it's good to start with clean um, dirt if you can. Um, one trick that I use is to, um, you, you know, reuse the soil that's already there, but always bury it underneath four or five inches um, possible of new soil and that will usually keep the seeds that are that deep from, from sprouting. Um, <clears throat> weeding a little bit often is much better than waiting a long time um, and what's really key about weeding especially with succulents is trying to keep things from getting started in the first place. Um, this is a, a lesson I had to learn myself when I planted my garden. For years um, after I planted my garden we had a, a couple of droughty winters and so I didn't really have much in the way of weeds during the winter so I didn't have to worry about things. But slowly during that time, I hadn't really noticed, but all kinds of seeds had blown in from the wind and from one or two, um, you know, clumps of grass here or there that I, you know, hadn't been particularly vigilant about removing. And then we had a wet winter. And in that wet winter, every seed that had blown into the garden started sprouting um, and I was overrun with weeds. Um, and it took me almost two years to get back to a, a state of, um, you know, fewer weeds again, because once you have the weeds going, they reinforce themselves, they scatter more seed, it just gets worse and worse. So I can't stress enough that when you do put a succulent garden together, make sure you keep on top of the weeds um, and just weeding a little bit every once in a while is, is usually enough. Um, but if you go too long in between weeding, you'll pay for it. Um, and so, um, you know, we talked earlier about um, conservative watering is great for the plants in terms of color and form. It's also great for weeds. Um, if you water thoroughly in a nice deep water, you know, standing at the bed and, and, and watering with a, with a, a turned down hose for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, that will be much better for the plants because their roots will be able to soak up the water and um, less frequent waters that are nice and deep will um, discourage weeds because the weeds won't be able to start at the surface as easily. Um, and a nice vigorous spray, as I mentioned earlier, um, for the parasites is also just great in general. Um, depending
depending on where you live in San Francisco or the Bay Area more generally, you may have you know highway soot, um, you may have you know, sea spray, um, you may have the general schmutz of urban living. Um, and in all of those cases, um, a spray with the hose um, can be a nice, can you know, freshen things up. And it's also good for the plants, um, especially rosette plants. Um, if they do, um, you know, if they get buildup of organic material and stuff in the center of those rosettes, um, that can encourage fungal, fungal problems and rot. So it's good to kind of spray things out. Um, and a lot of those, a lot of those plants are, are shaped so that rain or, or water falling on them will naturally clean out their structure, um, their kind of form so that water automatically blasts things off of their surface. All right. Well, that is pretty much the end of my talk. <clears throat> um, I can just go over uh, some shots of my yard and then we can open it up to questions. Um, so this is um, when we first got the house um, in Berkeley, it had been planted with a whole bunch of bushes and large plants. So it was kind of full of um, uh, plants. It was a flat yard um, and it was you know, um, completely um, covered in bushes. There were some native bushes, there were some you know, roses, there were a, a variety of plants. <clears throat> um, and so I removed a lot of those bushes, um, the Miracle of Craigslist, um, and then I brought in a whole bunch of soil and some big rocks to build up some mounds to create topography. Um, and so this is just a shot from after I had kind of put together, brought in all the soil and started building up the topography. Um, <clears throat> this is another shot from the housing house side of that bed. Um, and so this is after I escaped it originally. Um, this is a little bit, you know, say about a year after that original escaping. Um, you can see here this little, I've made a little awning with some screen over a plant that I was concerned about getting sunburned when I moved it. Um, and so this is one of the tricks you can use if you do, um, you know, have a plant that you need to move into a really bright location and it's in the summer, you know, you, you can't, you can't avoid the move. You can cover it up a little um, with, a, with a little bit of screen um, for, you know, a couple of weeks um, and that can usually help with the transition. Um, so this is just some shots. Um, so this is that same shot in that direction about three years later. Um, so you can see the plants have grown in a lot more, um, really course sort of expanded out. This is before, this is the agave that I ended up having to take out um, as it was getting to its largest size. Um, and then this is another shot from the other direction at that same time. Oh. Um, and so um, every garden changes, every garden evolves. And so eventually, the fence, let's see, that you can see here, um, the large fence along the street, this wooden fence. So it started to rot and to sag. So we had to replace the fence. And so I used that as an excuse to redo the front side of the garden. So this is that in sort of mid progress. I had moved some plants around at this point. Um, I had brought in a whole bunch of rocks and started planting new plants. You can see the, the this is all rubble that I had managed to collect over years from the side of the road in various places. This is taking down the fence, um, and this is the new fence, and so a refreshed garden. So this is also something that um, you know, the, one of the oh nice things about the succulents is um, that they are um, very resilient to being moved around, um, and so you know you can um, at various times if you want to you know dig up a succulent, kind of rescape things, rearrange things. As long as you're careful about sunburn, careful about um, you know their orientation to the sun, um, they're definitely something that you can rearrange, and you don't have to so concerned about moving them because they can definitely handle moves pretty well. All right, and that is it for my talk. Um, anybody got any questions? Um, we can go back to any of the images or any of the pages if you want to. Um, just yeah, me... hi Kip, it's Anissa. There's lots of questions. All so right. let's jump in. Um, what succulents are good in full light situation of a rooftop? So all succulents are gonna be good in full light situations. Um, I would say there's, you know, there's only a few that um, are sensitive to full sun, and even those can frequently grow in full sun. You just have to be careful when you first acquire them. So let me, let me unfull screen this for a moment. So actually, I, I wanted to bring up some, some champ plants to talk about. So I'll just talk about those because that's, that's a good answer to the full sun, full sun rooftop question. So Ioniums here um, are a champ um, in the Bay Area. You, you've probably seen them all over the place. There are lots of different Ioniums. They're um, native to the Canary Islands, um, and they're just wonderful. Um, all kinds of cultivars. There's you know, dark ones and light ones, green ones, variegated ones, pink ones, yellow ones. Um, they're great. They are um, robust growers, so they're one of the ones that will you know kind of bully the plants around them. 
um, but they also can compete very well with all kinds of other plants. So Ioniums are the sorts of thing you can, you can plant in just a regular um, garden setting and they will compete well with, you know, herbs and things like that even. Um, aloes are another super plant, also great for rooftops. Um, nothing, um, you know, they, they like sun. Um, they have the bonus of some very pretty blooms um, um, at certain times of year, very vigorous. Um, agaves are, um, you know, they're larger plants, generally speaking, there are a variety of, of small cultivars. Um, so one of these in a pot is usually kind of the, the centerpiece of a, of a, of a uh, planting. Um, and in pots, they will grow more slowly. So even an agave that will get gigantic, you know, 10, you know, 10, 12 feet across, if it's grown in a pot, it will take a very long time to get there. So you can enjoy even the larger species for a while um, on a rooftop. Um, I, I had a few agave when I was on my own rooftop in San Francisco. Uh, so these are mesems, um, and so mesems, uh, that's just short for mesem bryanthemum, um, which is a, one of the plants that, um, in this group. Um, and so these are a whole bunch of relatives of daisies from South America, South Africa. Um, South Africa is an amazing um, biological region. It has um, a, an astonishing array of species in a very small area, and a good portion of the country is in a climate like the Bay Area, um, a Mediterranean climate. And so Many plants from South Africa grow wonderfully here. Um, a few of these, this guy, um, Aloanopsis is wonderful. Titanopsis is wonderful. Um, let's see, this is a Pleospilos, another wonderful um, um, plant of that group. <coughs> Hayworthias are a wonderful group and they're ones that do like more shade. So um, Hayworthias you may have seen already. Um, they're kind of popular these days. Um, Home depots and at grocery stores and things like that. Um, and that is because they are more adapted to shade and um, they're also from um, South Africa, but they grow in areas where they are in grasslands and things like that. So they actually do like a little bit more shade. They can handle very bright conditions as well. You can always experiment with them, um, but this is definitely a plant that's more suited to shadier conditions. Um, Echeverias are a great new world group of succulents. Um, they grow mostly in you know, Mexico and Central America. Uh, but also in um, you know, the uh, south, southern United States. Um, they're wonderful, wonderful plants. Um, they're similar to the Dudleyas, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, there's all kinds of colors. There are many um, um, uh, plants like Echeverias and aren't called Echeverias anymore. Once upon a time, everything was called an Echeveria, but now there are Graptopetalums and, and all kinds of other plants. But Echeverias and sedums are wonderful, wonderful um, succulents, wonderful colors, wonderful shapes, very easy to grow. And as I mentioned earlier, the wonderful Dudleya, California native, um, there are all kinds of species here. There's more diversity in Southern California than here in Northern California, um, but you can grow most of the species that you find um, fairly well. They do like um, to be um, on a slope or another orientation where their rosette is not flat straight up um, because they can hold water in that rosette and encourage rot. So it's best if they're um, you know, angled with respect to the, um, the ground. Lots of wonderful, wonderful documents. Right, any other questions? Uh, absolutely. I'm gonna try and combine these two questions. So let's see how I do. Okay. Um, it's about uh, propagating. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, I currently have plants that are rooting indoors, but would eventually like to move them outdoors. I've had bad luck with overwatering. Now I feel like the small ones I'm rooting are underwater, underwatered. And when should I move them outdoors? And the, the second one, hopefully we can combine. Um, can you remove babies and clumps? Can you remove them and become new plants? Do you pot them right away? Or should I wait before potting? Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, um, dividing clumps and stuff, so succulents are definitely very resistant to being um, divided up and cut and broken apart, um, but you'll maximize the chance that the plants will reestablish if you give them a couple of days at least, um, and that allows the, the scarred areas to heal over, to dry out, and that means that it's less likely that fungi or other kinds of bacteria can get in there um, that might you know, cause rot or damage to the plant. So if you give them a few days sitting on a, you know, on the porch um, in the shade, um, that scar will dry out and then it's much more likely the plant will survive. So that, that's a great way to handle that. Um, in terms of moving things from indoors to out, you can move things indoors to out anytime you want. Um, moving things from, you know, 
Succulents really, in almost all cases, should be grown outside. Um, some of us, you know, can't, can't grow them anywhere else because we don't have outdoor space. Um, and so, you know, you can, um, you can definitely um, grow succulents inside, but ideally succulents want to be outside with lots of air movement and very bright light. Mm -hmm. um, and so moving them outside, um, the sooner the better is always what I would say. Um, and um, since it is now, we're moving into summer, we're moving into the brightest parts of the year, um, you probably want to be careful about moving them to a spot where they get lots of sun. So as you move succulents out, you best to say do it in the spring, um, early in the spring when the, when the sunlight is less intense and slowly move them into the brightest spots. So don't, don't take them out to the balcony where um, they get sun at noon right away. Um, take them out to the shady spot at the edge and then slowly move them towards the brightest spots. But they will be happy once they're in those bright spots and they will grow. I mean, even if they happen to get a little bit sunburned, most succulents will, you know, continue to grow new tissue that isn't sunburned. Um, but just be careful when you move them. Thank you, Kim. Um, let's see. Uh, is it normal for outside lower leaves to dry up and drop off? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so um, even in their natural habitats, succulents are um, expecting to cast off older leaves as they make new foliage. Now, not every um, succulent will do that. Some succulents do hold on to things. And a succulent that is in you know, a particularly good spot in its natural environment may have a lot more leaves than a different one. But uh, the, a sign, but it's, it's not a bad sign that the lower leaves dry up and fall off. Um, really, the only question is the plant shrinking or is it staying the same size? If it's staying the same size, you're fine. If it's getting bigger, you're even better. If the plant is shrinking, then that's a sign that something is wrong. You might need to water it more. You might need to repot it and give it fresh soil or more nutrients. Um, you might need to check it to make sure that there isn't a problem at the roots. Sometimes um, you can get um, mealy bugs and other insects infesting the roots of succulents. So there's various things that you might want to look at if your plant is shrinking, but just having dead leaves, um, it's not a problem at all. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think you've kind of hit on this is, um, does the soil in potted succulents need to be replenished occasionally? Yeah. So, um, so you, you want to repot all your plants, not just succulents, every, every kind of plant. Um, you want to repot them periodically for a variety of reasons. So if, obviously, you know, there's the issue of getting root bound. The plant may get too big. Um, it may, you know, and it's, its roots may become constrained in the pot, which can, which can damage the plant. Um, not all plants need to, you know, not all plants mind being root bound. Some actually prefer it, um, but, uh, but it's, it's good. It's good to um, repot them for their roots as well. But also over time when you're watering plants in pots, the water that you're using has got dissolved salts in it. So even in San Francisco with Hetch Hetchy water, um, it's very clean water, but there are dissolved salts in that water. And that salt stays in the soil after the water dries up and is soaked up by the plant. And so over time, the soil in any pot will build up, a, you know, will build up salt slowly. Um, and so that eventually becomes, comes to the point where the plant has a hard time soaking up other nutrients from the soil because there's so much salt there. So that's just a good, a good reason. If you don't have plants outside where rains, you know, where they get rained on in the winter and the rains can flush that salt out, you know, nice pure rainwater can flush the salt out every once in a while. Um, that's something you definitely want to be careful of. So indoor plants, particularly, and that's house plants, succulents, you know, all kinds of plants like that, where water can't drain away from them freely, um, will often build up salt over time. And so it's good to, you know, repot mm -hmm. plants every two or three years, depending on the size of the plant. Thank you. Let's see if we can fit in a couple more. I know we are running out of time, but um, how to repot spiny plants and cactus and how to weed around spiny plants. Yeah, so I mentioned before, get yourself a giant pair of tweezers. Um, you, can, you can hop on um, Google or eBay, type in giant tweezers or giant force nips. Um, and they will, they will basically, um, you know, you, they're, they're pretty economical to get and it, it looks just like a giant pair of tweezers. Um, and so that lets you get close to those succulents like that. Um, in terms of moving um, and handling them, a beach towel is a great um, choice. Roll it up, kind of make a, you know, a, a sausage-y um, roll of beach towel, and then you can wrap that around succulents to move them around, um, and it will for, you know, keep the thorns at bay. Um, you can also use um, grocery bags, so, so um, wadded up grocery bags are an, another option. Um, you just basically want something that's just strong enough because you know that there's enough spines generally on a cactus that if you can you can pick it up by the spines it's just the spines would pierce your own flesh but a beach towel or like a, a crumbled up rolled up uh, grocery bag will, will protect you wonderful thank you 
And let's see, one last question. Uh, what it, or is there a proper way to trim an Osculoaria deltoides after they've bloomed? So, um, you know, Osculoaria is very, you know, is uh, very resilient to being trimmed. So, you know, you can, you can usually cut it back in all kinds of ways and it will sprout back out. Um, the blooms, the bloom heads do become unsightly because it is so thick with blossoms. And so after it blooms, when those blossoms die, the plant sort of looks like it's covered in kind of a brown, brown crust um, because of all the dead blossoms. So if, um, in those kinds of circumstances, it's not easy because the blooms are everywhere to trim them off one by one. So what, um, what you can do is just, you know, give it a little bit of extra uh, vigorous watering to kind of blast the old bloom stems off. And generally new growth will come out fairly quickly um, and cover that up. But um, osculator grows fast enough as well that you can just, you know, kind of trim off um, branches that have bloomed and let the branches that haven't bloomed grow and grow over them and, grow over them and in their place. All right. Well, friends, we are out of time. We don't want to keep Kip too long. And those were some great questions. And like I said, you can I put the link to the chat of today's notes. I put in some book lists that you can find to get more information about succulents and more summer stride info. And you can watch this again on YouTube because that was a lot of inf great information that Kip provided. Um, we have a lot of uh, gardening programs on our YouTube. We've partnered with the California Native Plant Society and I'll add that to the doc, but yeah, check it out again. Kip, thank you so much for helping us kick out Summer Stride with a great presentation and San Francisco Public Library community. Thank you for joining us today. All right, thanks everybody. Bye.